Welcome back to the Tech Leaders Talk podcast, where experts and leaders in the wide world of IT discuss the industry and hard-earned career wisdom with your host, Barry Newkirk. Today's guest on Tech Leaders Talk is Dan Johnson. Dan is currently the Chief Operating Officer of iManagement Consulting, LLC, a Florida-based firm providing services to corporate boards and C-suite executives. With more than 27 years of experience, Dan has a proven track record of establishing IT strategy, translating strategy into action, and leading cross-functional teams to deliver measurable results. As an accomplished and strategic leader, Dan is known for building and developing high-performing teams and creating win-win relationships with internal customers and external partners. Dan is also a certified project management professional, holds an ITIL Foundations certification, and is a Lean Six Sigma black belt. Let's dive into this conversation between Barry and Dan Johnson. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Barry. You and I know each other a good bit and uh, have done a lot of cool stuff, um, both personally and professionally together. So tell us about, um, we're going to start early days. Tell us about how you grew up, your family life, uh, things you were involved in. Uh, give us a sense of, of Dan, probably from birth to say end of high school. <laughs> okay. So, well, I, you know, I was a nerd from the beginning, I think, and uh, uh, just very... <clears throat> just very studious and and uh, grew up in a very conservative uh, Christian household, going to church every week. Um, uh, the, the school we went to was related to the church. Okay. And so now that's where I first got introduced to computers. Hmm. Um, so seventh grade, I believe it was, uh, somebody purchased for the school, I think, uh, 12 Apple IIEs. There you go. And those were the first computers I uh, ever laid hands on. And uh, it was love at first sight, I think. And that was the beginning of my IT career, I think, right there. Um, learning to program, program those. And uh, I borrowed one one summer. I brought it home from school. They let me borrow it and just played on it all summer long. And and so that, that was the beginning of the passion. Tell us about your family. Do you have siblings? I mean, give us, paint that picture so for us. I'm the oldest of six. Oh, um, wow. Uh, my father flew corporate corporate jets. Mm. Um, so he was a pilot early on. He did crop dusting, and uh, we moved around a lot. And then uh, the high school years were, were uh, corporate. He was a corporate pilot for Coca-Cola. And uh, my mother stayed at home. Uh, she did participate. She taught French. She she speaks fluent French, so she taught French at our high school. Nice. Yeah. That is cool. I took two years of French in high school, and it was not a good scene. Not a good scene. <laughs> um, and uh, so you have – you're the oldest of six. Correct. Are any of your other siblings in technology at all? Or? Well, my brother um, has owned a technology company, so he – he partnered with a guy who was doing uh, telemedicine and mm. and things like that, and they developed a company. He's uh, he since sold that, but uh, but he did own a technology company. Okay, cool. And so you grew up, you moved around a lot, but if your dad flew for Coca Cola, I'm assuming you were in the Greater Atlanta area, Birmingham. So, Birmingham. Okay. Yeah, Birmingham, uh, the largest uh, Coke bottler, or, or the fifth largest Coke bottler, I think, in the world. Oh, and so they they flew all over the southeast, uh, mm. visiting the various plants, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and, and various places. Yeah. Wow. So you you got hooked when you were seventh eighth grade on computers. Right. Um, I'm assuming that f went through the through line of high school as well. Oh yeah. Tell yeah, us about some of the stuff you did there. <laughs> you know, we back in the day. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot, and there mm. wasn't a whole lot of rules back then, and. <laughs> We had a we had a substitute teacher who taught at Jacksonville State University in their computer department, and we would see him from time to time. And he would get us involved in uh, the computer fairs over at the uh, at the college. Mm -hmm. uh, we would submit little software programs we had written for for review, and uh, so it, I mean there there wasn't a whole lot out there then. It was just kind of yeah, just kind of beginning yeah uh, from from my point of view. Yeah. When I went to college, um, we had a computer lab on campus that had eight computers that I never went in the building. It was a totally separate building. Uh, I was a poli sci major. But my stepfather um, was a, a double E computer guy, big time, and he had an Apple IIe. And he is still, to this day, a tinkerer in computers and writes his own programs and all this stuff. And uh, 
I don't understand any of it. You know, I really, I really don't. Um, and then from high school, you graduated, went to Bob Jones. I did. Okay. Tell us about that. So, um, I see, I was a computer lab supervisor there for a while. So, uh, back in the day you, you would, uh, earn a little bit of money mm -hmm. uh, against your tuition for work okay. uh, on site. So I'd go sit in the computer lab for two hours and check people in and check people out and, and uh, also, I think during that time, I had to take a Turbo Pascal class. And that was interesting. There were some nights where I, I went back to the dorm where my brain was completely fried. I'm sure. Uh, writing software for, for that class. So. But you did not am, – am I right in looking at your bio? You did not have an IT degree from Bob Jones or you did? I did not. I was studying cinema and motion picture production. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how did those two cross? I mean, I don't, well, you know, really, I, they I recruit really a lot. Didn't, they really didn't at that time. I mean, uh, back at Bob Jones at the time, everything was was uh, done on 16 millimeter film and, okay. and manually, manually cutting film and splicing it together. Wow. And I, I don't really think the two came together until later in my career when I was working for Disney and you began to see see uh you know uh, a lot of digital on uh what they called back in the day non-linear editing systems start to take shape mm -hmm. and uh what was done on tape decks you know and edited on tape decks then started being fed into the computer system and edited mm -hmm. uh, in a non-linear fashion so uh that was that was significant change in in the blending of technology and film hmm well, take me back. I mean, you, you talked about you fell in love with computers, love at first sight, I think you said in seventh grade. Yeah. You go to you go to college, university, and um I'm surprised based on your earlier story that you didn't get an IT degree. So um help us understand about the choices there and and why you chose the degree that you chose. Yeah, I was really early on really interested in film and I okay. thought I thought I would pursue that as a career. Okay. And there really in terms of a there wasn't an IT degree back back then that I remember there was you could take some programming classes and you could take some data processing classes and things like that but there wasn't a Mm. There wasn't the the formality and the tracks that you see today in in school. I was just fascinated by by cameras and lights and in that whole process. Okay. Uh, at that time, and so so obviously those things migrated eventually throughout your career. They have. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go into. Uh, so you leave Bob Jones. So what what was your first job out of college, Dan? So I had a friend. Um, I did some work over uh, in Russia, and I. I met a uh, – there was a group of college students that spent two months in Russia. Mm. And I met I met this fella, and uh, we became good friends. And and uh, eventually I decided I wanted to work for Disney, and, and, and this guy lived in Orlando, Florida. So not only that, but his dad was a House of Representatives a member for the state of Florida. So I called him up and said, hey, can I come down and stay with you a while? I'm going to try to try to get a job at Disney. Mm -hmm. And so they were happy to do that. And in fact, uh, uh, his dad wrote a letter uh, on state house letterhead to the vice president of film and tape at Disney and said, hey, I want you to take a look at Dan, you know. And uh, uh, he called me up at that time and uh, said, hey, anybody that wants to try to work in this career is crazy enough to want to work in this career, deserves a shot at it. And so I, I, um, I was given the opportunity to work on some Disney Channel uh, shows at that time, production. Okay. I spent about three years doing that. So you were three years at Disney, mm -hmm. um, primarily in the Orlando Kissimmee area? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, and what kind of stuff did you, did you do? So, you know, started as a, what's called a production assistant, which is the, you know, the grunts. Oh, Okay. <laughs> So just anything and everything around a production that needs to happen. Um, and then uh, moved into what's called production coordinator, uh, which is really Disney has a lot of clients that come in to shoot on their property. And they they uh, have a lot of rules, as you can imagine, oh, about sure. what you can shoot, what you can't shoot. Um, and then coordinating with all of the departments at Disney and making sure that those clients have a good experience. And so. Okay. 
I eventually went into that role and um, and helped clients uh, complete their their film and video projects on on site there. Okay, interesting. So why did you leave Disney? Sound like it was a dream job. <laughs> well, uh, it didn't pay that well, <laughs> and there were there were no uh, real benefits for that kind of role at the time. Okay, and uh, I was just getting married um, and having uh, our first child. Mm-hmm. And I felt like health insurance was important. So, um, and that's another opportunity that came along uh, uh, as a contractor to the military. So, there was a STRICOM division of the military, Army, and Navy mm-hmm. uh, simulated warfare. So, they, they had to do with VR back in that time, mm-hmm. as VR was. <laughs> And so they needed people to work in, in their computer department. Okay. Um, and so I knew a man through uh, actually the church church we went to. And uh, he was he was uh, very familiar with the fact that I was interested in computers and technology mm. and, uh, and asked if I would come interview for a help desk position. And uh, that worked out. So. That's where everybody starts in IT, right? <laughs> help desk. <laughs> help it's desk, amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> it's amazing. So is that kind of like when you talk about VR for the military? I mean, I picture that old. Uh, I think it's Matthew Broderick movie, War Game kind of thing. Is that? It was a little more advanced than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were doing um, they were doing uh, motion tracking mm. uh, back then and things like that. Soldiers on the ground with VR and and. Uh, uh, Oh, okay. They could actually walk through a battle scene. Oh, and, how and, cool uh, is that? Hide behind buildings and things like that. Okay, interesting. And so you were at that company for how long? That help desk job was a nine-month job. Okay. Yep. And what happened after that? I decided I wanted to get back into what my passion was, which was was film and production, and, and you could throw music production in there. Okay. My brother lived in uh, near Nashville, Tennessee at the time. Mm-hmm. And so I decided to move up there uh, to the Nashville area and pursue um, those opportunities in and around Nashville. And I did a little bit uh, with some uh, production work up there, but uh, I found that uh, I found that computer work was more consistent and uh, provided for the family. So sure. I, I kind of ended up uh, going back into that scene. Okay. So you're in Nashville now. Um, and you ended up at uh, Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce, right? I did. Tell us how you made that transition. How did that happen? How did you get introduced or yeah. find out about that? So I was working for an estate planning company at the time for about two years, and I was their only computer guy. Mm. So I did everything for the entire company. Um, and, uh, I forget exactly how this came to be, but, uh, the director of it of the department of labor and workforce development, Tennessee, uh, happened to be a Bob Jones grad. Really? And he found out about me, um, and, uh, and offered me a job. And so I moved from, from the estate planning company over to the state of Tennessee. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how he found out about you? Is like an alumni remember. directory or Maybe something? Maybe I applied for it. I, I don't remember exactly how, but uh, uh, but yeah, that was a common a common theme. That's interesting. That's interesting. I have a brother who lives in Augusta, and he uh, graduated from the Citadel, which we were talking about a little while ago. And um, his first five or six different opportunities when he got out of the school were specifically because he was a Citadel alumni. Like he got an interview, he got a call, he got a, you know, Hey, I want you to come over here cause you're a Citadel guy. So similar kind of thing for you there at, at uh, with BJ. So, um, what kind of things were you involved in at, um, the Tennessee department of labor? So I started out as a, uh, I forget the title, um, but I was basically doing some programming in Power Builder, okay, um, and and just doing some other you know uh, support, you know, more detail like server support and things like that. Right. And then there was a uh, what I'll call a kerfuffle. We had a, a huge project underway to rewrite a mainframe system to 
to uh, a web-based system. And there was some improprieties that went on uh, between a couple of the staff on that project. Mm -hmm. And so they ba it, it was actually a, a pretty crazy time. They came in and escorted these two people out of the building, took their stuff. I mean, there was some concern about maybe some felonies had been committed and things. And mm -hmm. um, so my, my director came to me at that time and said, hey, uh, I don't know anybody else here that could take on this project. Would you be willing to take it? Really? And that was my introduction or move from being really a technology guy into project management. So moving from there into, into schedules and, and budgets and, and plans and communication and, and all those different skill sets uh, that actually hands on uh, technology. Did you have any background in project management prior to that? I did not. I just kind of got thrown in it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. How'd the first uh, 30 days go? <laughs> well, it was interesting. And, uh, you know, it's interesting as I look back how the rules evolve. Mm -hmm. And now it's much more structured, much more disciplined. Back, back then, there wasn't necessarily that rigor. In fact, I don't even think back then the Project Management Institute uh, – was a thing. Um, and so it was just, Hey, can you, can you land this plane? Right. right. Can we finish wow. the development and can we get everybody trained and up and running? And so we had a really, we had a good vendor mm -hmm. that was doing the work. And, um, and so I, I basically made their project manager a really good partner of mine. Yeah. And together, together we, uh, we got that done. That's amazing. How long was, uh, were you in the project management of that specific uh, rewrite. I'm going to say a year and a half, maybe. Um, so you went from, for our listeners, you went from zero PM experience to you're running this enterprise rewrite. An $8 million project back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hate to use the uh, flippant cliche, right place, right time, but I it's mean, true. it sounds like it's true. Yeah. And this comes about something we'll talk about earlier uh, or later in the show is that, uh, you know, why, why would he come to me and ask me that? Absolutely. You know, and that's, uh, I think important. Um, you know, some of those principles that we'll talk about later that are important to work in the tech space. Yeah. Well, so just to double click on that was the person who came to you and asked you to take that job. Was that the same Bob Jones graduate? No. Okay. It's a different person. Yeah. He had, he had then left and this was a, uh, another director that had been promoted into that role. Okay. And uh, he had been in state government for a long time hmm. um, and just a fantastic man. But he, I guess he looked out over his staff sure, and said, who can I, who can I trust with this? And, right. Uh, and so he came and got me. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's, you know, it's amazing how uh, almost everyone's career story, uh, regardless of if they're in IT or PR or you know, legal accounting, whatever manufacturing, there's some bluebird that I would call it that just, Hey, this thing happened, happened to me in my career, happened to you in your career. Just, you can't predict, you can't plan for, you can't, you know, architect, um, the pathway and it just kind of happens. Mm -hmm. And, and there's that been a happens. couple of those. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you're at Tennessee and then looks like you moved to Florida. So tell us about that transition. So that all had to do with that project. So we landed that plane in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and uh, it was going well. People were using using this new workforce system, mm -hmm. and so Florida called uh, the the sister agency in Florida, which was then called the Agency for Workforce Innovation. They called and said, "Hey Tennessee, we we hear that you guys have landed this this workforce system." We're using the exact same vendor in Florida mm. to do the exact same project in Florida, and we're failing. What's the difference between your project and what's what's going on down here? Mm -hmm. So we invited them up for three days, and there was a delegation, I think, of about four people from Florida that came to Tennessee. And uh, uh, my boss, the director of IT, asked me to sit in the room and entertain them for three days about this project which we did and 
over the course, just answered all their questions. They would ex explain, well, we got this issue, and we say, well, this is how we dealt with this here. And uh, at the end of those three days, um, the chief financial officer uh, of that agency in Florida uh, said, the big difference is, is you. Mm. So about a month later, after some conversations, uh, uh, they decided to bring me down to Florida, hire me, move me down there to take over that project in Florida. So that's how I got to Florida. So one of the things that we keep coming back to in these podcast uh, sessions, Dan, is why people make decisions to make a move like that or, or what have you. So one of the things you just told us a few minutes ago was that your brother was in the greater Nashville area. Right. Um, you had a young family in Nashville. You kind of, you know, what I would say, putting down some roots there, uh, obviously had a lot of success at the state of Tennessee. So, so what made you make the decision to make that move from Tennessee to, to Florida? So my, my wife uh, at the time, her family was in Orlando, so it was closer. It was a move back, right, mm -hmm. closer sure. to her family. But one, one of the things that sort of advice that I got from a, a wise person one time was all things being equal, right, and that's a lot. That's a lot in that statement. Mm -hmm. But all things being equal, go where the money is, right? So money is the, final, the right. final thing to consider. So as we looked at that, the environment – the environment, as far as we could tell, was going to be a, uh, a step up in terms of career. Mm -hmm. uh, we were going to be closer to her family. Uh, the money was significantly more than we were making. And we feel like in Tennessee we had reached a cap at that point in terms okay. of salary Fair. Um, and upward mobility. So, um, so career-wise, it made a lot of sense. So it was just kind of time, and it made, mm -hmm. yeah, it was great, great. It was a, what I would call a no-brainer. Right. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, tell us about the project at Florida. I mean, you took over the, right. That was about, uh, two and a half years of grueling project that, that, that project was probably the most stressful project I've, I have encountered in, in my career. And it was hard. It was a $16 million project. Mm. And if you know anything about the States, you know, I think maybe California in terms of size, you've got New York, California, Texas, and Florida and, and, Florida competes for third and fourth in terms of size. So their, their level of rigor mm -hmm. is much greater than, say, a Tennessee or an Alabama. Sure. And so uh, um, I learned uh, professionally, I learned an entirely different set of discipline in, term, in, in, uh, in rigor and in detail and communication and thoroughness on that project that I had not been used to in the Tennessee project. So that matured me a lot. Like that was going to the gym and working out hard every day. Uh, um, did you know that when you were going into did it? Not, did not. In fact, I was told after I was down there that they were only going to give that project one more month under this new, Oh my Lord. under this new leader, me wow. to, to turn a corner. And they didn't share that with me at the time. So, uh, but the good news is we landed that plane as well. Talk to us about some of the difficulties in that project. I mean, you're talking about <clears throat> that's the hardest project you've worked on. So, you know, the, the thing that I try to do sometimes is put myself in the seat of our listener and, um, you know, in their world, their reality is today, tomorrow, next week. Um, and I want them to hear from seasoned professionals like yourself and some other folks that we've talked to, hey, there's there's life after the hard stuff. So tell us a little bit, give us some inside baseball on that project and why it was so difficult. Yeah, for me, the technology was the same. The, the business processes were the same mm -hmm. from Tennessee to Florida. The difference was the politics and the mm. – and the, and the, sub, the uh, um, the stakeholder group. So the stakeholders of that project, remember it had already gone south. Sure. The legislature was already heavily involved in, in scrutinizing it. Uh, you had these workforce boards across the state that all of these leaders of these workforce boards were uh, in somewhat against it, right? Because it provided a level of accountability for them that, that they had not had in the past. Mm -hmm. 
And so you had all of these people scrutinizing it and, and in some cases uh, against its success. Mm -hmm. And then I have my bosses who were very interested in it, in it succeeding because that could affect their careers. Absolutely. So there, there were a lot of um, uh, information being passed around that were uh, true or not true and having to navigate that all the way up to the, to the legislative staff and out to those. Uh, I think, you know, one of, one of the things that's important to me is pursuing truth Mm -hmm. And that truth is not always popular. And so learning how to uh, take the truth and craft it in a way, in, in, a, in a message that is going to be as best received by that stakeholder group and knowing, knowing there are people on all sides of that coin. So I think that helped develop me professionally in how I talk about things mm. and how I present information. So. Mm, knowing you, that gives me a lot of insight into um, why you communicate in the way that you do. I, I, I get that now. So thank you for that. So you, you, you landed that plane, as you said, and then you left the state of Florida. Is that right? Yeah, there was a, a consulting firm um, that was uh, there in Tallahassee mm -hmm. that uh, had some projects going in Montgomery, Alabama, which is where I was raised. I was raised in Northeast Alabama, but that's close, right? Sure. So uh, they came to me and said, hey, we'd like you, you to move to Montgomery. Uh, we'll take care of your house. We you to move up there. We've got a big project going with the Department of Corrections in Alabama mm -hmm. that uh, we think needs some help. And we, we want you to come, like, oversee all of our project, project managers, right? Wow. Grow them to be better project managers and, and also help us with these Alabama projects. So I moved up there. We ended up taking that project from a $1 million project to a $5 million project um, and, uh, and, and delivering for, for that agency. So uh, after about two and a half years, they, they had an issue there uh, with the pipeline, keeping the pipeline full. So uh, after about two and a half years landing that um the projects they had, there were others, there were others in Montgomery as well. Mm -hmm. um, they began to downsize. So they kind of almost shut that office down in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started putting my feelers, feelers back out. And uh, the very agency that I had been at before in Florida said, yep, we want you back. So move back down here and, uh, and we got some more for you to do. So that's how I ended up back in Florida. So when you went to, um, the for-profit company <clears throat> in Alabama, it sounded like you almost elevated to not a hands-on day-to-day project manager, but or a portfolio manager. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And did, did you like that role? I did. I did. But I was still, <clears throat> at that point, I was still very much a uh, technologist. And, and uh, you know, it's a struggle uh, to make that, leap and i even yeah. see it today in in some of the clients that we have now and, and that we consult with it's uh and this was another whole conversation i thought i might have with you is that uh in the it space uh, we give titles to things but what are what are truly the activities that that individual is doing i mean i've seen directors of it that are really server administrators absolutely they run around doing desktop support so so what does it mean? What does that title mean? It really means what activities are you responsible for, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so always look at those. Uh, but truly there I was uh, uh, doing project portfolio management and, and overseeing a number of projects for different – they had going with different state agencies at the same time. Okay, cool. And then uh, so you went back to Florida. What, what took place there? So this is where I met one of my one of my big mentors mm -hmm. um, um, that helped me with this transition into into leadership, purely into leadership. So uh, I went back to Florida. There was a different CIO. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't know me. He took he took me based on the recommendation of the CFO. OK. And uh, um, took me into his office, uh, observed me in the work that I did and then and then some point um, decided that I was worth investing in mm. and so he he brought me into that inner circle 
um, and started teaching me things like um, what I what I think in terms of a CIO, in terms of uh, budget, people, policies, processes, mm-hmm. and how to orchestrate those uh, to run an IT program effectively at, at a, a large state agency. So, hmm. and, and I, I think I worked for him for about seven years and, and that was really the transition from, from getting my head out of the weeds of IT mm-hmm. up into the organizational level or the enterprise level. Okay. Um, and then you became, um, uh, director of IT planning and administration at Children and Families in right. Florida. So he, he went over there as their CIO and okay. eventually became their deputy secretary. Okay. Um, and he called me over there to run. Um, at that point, the state had a $20 million contract with the state data center. So there was a separate agency that ran the data center. So we had a, a $20 million relationship. Sure. And so he asked me to come over there and primarily see that relationship. And uh, we were able to reduce reduce our cost by over a million dollars a year just by just by looking at the details of that contract and what we had on contract and, and uh, you know, uh, being diligent about our inventories and how many servers we had, whether those, I mean, we had, we had servers that we were paying for we weren't even using. I mean, just, you know, it had gotten so big that nobody was, managing it right and right. so uh yeah that happens in a lot of big enterprises i find them like, all the time yeah yeah commercial government it doesn't matter so then you went to kpmg i did which um you know you had been in state government a couple of stints two different states obviously great um track record success record um tell me tell me what drew you to kpmg so in the state as you can imagine uh, especially at an agency like DCF, which has the largest fr- footprint, technology mm-hmm. footprint in Florida. Mm-hmm. There's every technology known to man in that agency. Sure. And especially enterprise class technology. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I'd been around that. I'd managed that. I'd worked with those vendors. I had been uh, working with Ernst & Young and KPMG and Deloitte and Accenture and all the big names in terms of delivering different projects and sure. and overseeing those technology components. And um, so at one point, um, that relationship turned into, hey, um, one, one of my uh, colleagues that I had worked with had gone to KPMG. Hmm. And uh, there was a point at which he called me up and said, hey, we'd, we'd like for you to come over here and join my team. So I uh, went to work there, traveled the country for a little over a year, I think it was. Um, major corporate corporate clients. We had a, a client in Chicago that spent $1 billion, with a B, dollars a year just in IT. Wow. That I assessed. Uh, I assessed a... Um, a federal federally funded bank in San Francisco, uh, just a number. Uh, Disney, we did some work uh, mm. uh, assessing Disney's telecom uh, program in in Florida. Uh, just some some big corporate clients, and it was then in going and assessing these organizations that I realized the level of rigor that I had learned at Florida in mm. the state. I went into those organizations and saw the same problems, right? And th- that kind of gave me the confidence to, knew, to know at that point in my career, I kind of knew what I was doing, right? <laughs> and I had, I, had, I had somehow grown into something that was valuable. Right. And that was probably the first time in my career that I felt like that. So, you, so that's a key point for our listeners. You grew into, you became something just by doing the work. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's a lot of young people, and I certainly was this way when I was young. You know, you look at your leaders, and you say, "Yeah, I could do that. Mm-hmm. I could do that." And and there's a desire just to be put in that because I've got this degree or I've got this whatever. I should be in that chair. Mm-hmm. But for me, um, for me, it was it was being diligent at the thing I had to do right then, mm. whether that was delivering a document whether that was delivering a piece of software code, 
whether that was delivering a, a $8 million project that was under turmoil, whatever it was, it's complete focus on doing that thing well mm -hmm. is what led to the next thing. Right. That's how I got, got where I am. Yeah. Yeah. One of my, uh, my wife, as you know, is a uh, Gallup Strength Finders coach and one of my top five strengths on the, on the Strength Finders continuum is focus. And so I tell people, yeah, I could step over a dead body on the way to a goal. That ain't no problem for me. <laughs> um, and I, and, you know, I say that jokingly, of course, but um, I think focus is uh, something that I look for when I hire people. And then when I look to partner with either customers or outside partners or whoever is, you know, are they trying to be everything, all people, or are they trying to really focus on what they do? And so that's, that's important. Well, that's how we, that's how we coach our clients uh, today. We had, a, when I was with KPMG, since we're on that one, mm -hmm. uh, we had a client that I, I went and assessed. Uh, they had 120 IT projects in flight at the same time. And uh, they were actually, I was there to find out why two of their largest projects were behind schedule and over budget. Mm. Um, and so one of the things I told them, I, I gave them a, a myriad of of reasons but one of the primary ones was you guys are trying to do too much at the same time right mm. you really have five people in your it shop that know your business processes inside and out know your current systems inside and out and they have to be in every meeting and there's no way that you're going to be able to 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 land 120 projects all at the same time cut back focus on the five or six that are really important to your organization and get those done and you'll find out after a year or two, you've accomplished way more through focus than you will trying to move 120 things at the same time. Just, just doesn't go well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the, uh, what's the phrase? Less is more. You know, I'm a big fan of that phrase. So you left KPMG. You were there for a year traveling the country, getting exposed to all yeah, these really cool. Yeah, that wasn't really great cool, for family life. I, I imagine. I, I did right. a little bit of that myself. So, um and so you left KPMG. Tell us about leaving there and, and what you did next. So there was a little bit of family trouble at that point, and uh, uh, it was probably exacerbated by the amount of travel. Sure. And uh, ended up in, in a divorce mm -hmm. situation, uh, which wasn't, wasn't pleasant at all. So um, decided to, to pull out of there and uh, start my own firm. Remember, I, I realized I had something of value. Absolutely. Offer then, especially sure. looking at what my bill rate was. <laughs> so, so I said, hey, I can uh, maybe do this on my own and stay home. Mm -hmm. So we started a little company called iManagement Consulting. And uh, it wasn't long after that that I met Barry Newkirk. Mm. And uh, Barry and I decided, you and I decided to kind of partner together and do some work together. And yeah. that's how we, we came to know each other. Yep. Yep. And that's one. So I, I know about the um, family challenges because we connected right after you left KPMG. Family calamities, pressures, uh, events are important to listen to, are important to listen to. Um, sometimes they're forced upon you, which is what it sounds like here. But sometimes it, if you're if you're listening correctly, you can make other choices than what conventional wisdom tells people. So um, I appreciate you telling us that story. So tell us about your move to Rewa. So that was thanks to you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we were looking at doing some uh, some consulting work, and I think they had come to you uh, mm -hmm. as a client and mm -hmm. said, "Hey, we've." We've got a situation here where we've we've got some stuff going on in IT. We don't really know what what it is or how to quantify it, but it's not good. Mm -hmm. And so, can we uh, partner with you, Barry, to to get a consultant to come in here and just assess the situation for us? So, uh, you ended up calling me in for that work, uh, which I think lasts about eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Was the original engagement, and and I uh, came in and did an I just a general IT assessment risk assessment yep um provided that back to the client and uh the client at that point said uh wow there's a lot we need to do dan would you be willing to stay on for another three months and help us get some of these things started 
which you were happy to keep me there sure. uh, for another three months. And then that three months led to another three months. And um, I think it was after that that uh, that they said, hey, we'd like for you to stay here for a while. Mm-hmm. And would you entertain a, um, a full-time position? And I had a lot of objections at that point because I, I just started a, a company. Um, uh, I had uh, some responsibilities with, with children and, and all of those things. And so... Anyway, they they made sure all of those objections went away, um, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I spent, I think, about four years there, Mm -hmm. uh, basically rebuilding their IT from from the ground up, literally. Everything had to be replaced. That's one of the great reclamation projects that I use when I talk to clients about kind of where they are and where they could be. So give us, you know, a generic overview of kind of what was the situation at Rewa and then what did you help them get to what they enjoy now? Well, yeah, I'll tell you, tell you things that were shared publicly. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we yeah. don't, won't cross any, any yeah, confidentiality absolutely. lines, but, uh, you know, the CEO was, was very vocal about the fact that they were stuck in the eighties and uh, needed to be brought into the 21st century, quote, kicking and screaming. That mm-hmm. was that was the quote that he shared a lot. Uh, and, and there was a lot of truth to that. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember visiting one of the plants when I when I first got there, water treatment plants, and there were gateway computers uh, uh, on the floor, operational. And, and uh, that'll just give you a sense for... And then I think the the IT some of the IT staff um, had had come up there and had not looked at some of the uh, methodologies and best practices that were in the in the world of IT like like the IT infrastructure library which is now called ITSM mm-hmm. uh, service management um, and so there wasn't even a common language I almost couldn't speak the language because they were so far. Some of the some of the staff were so far uh, behind, and um, long story short, uh, there were some that left on their own, mm-hmm. um, and so we were able to replace those with with quality mm-hmm. uh, individuals and build a build an IT program that focused on uh, the right people, processes, and technologies, and were able to revolutionize um, yeah their program there. Yeah, it's a it's a world of difference. I mean. Um, you're right in telling the story that uh, my wife, Tracy, actually was connected with one of their executives at Rewa in some fashion. And so I got a call one day and <clears throat> had a number of meetings before you and I met. And um, I thought, these people really are in the 80s, that no doubt about it. And um, and so where they are now is it's light years ahead of where, where they are now. I still have a lot of friends over there and some folks that work with us over there. So tell us about um, leaving Rewa and um, kind of what I would maybe say relaunching I management consulting and kind the kind of work you're doing now and how's that structured and what your focus is. Give us some sense of that. Yeah. So I met, I met my new bride and, um, and uh, at Rewa and, and so we decided. Set, my brain is a problem-solving brain. I'm not a maintenance guy, right? Really? So, Let me write that down. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm I'm one that I like to solve the problem. I like to solve the puzzle, and then move on to the next puzzle. So I had gotten Reba to a point where I felt they were they were stable. They were mm-hmm. in great shape. They were secure. They were on supported technologies. They had a good team, and uh, and so. Ashley and I decided to is a good good way to say it relaunch mm-hmm. uh, I management consulting, and she has a big background in in public relations and marketing, and I, I thought that was a good synergy uh, mm-hmm. together. So sure. we got out there and and uh, and began consulting, and uh, it's been great. Uh, we love it. We really do. Tell us the kind of things that y'all are focused on. The kind of projects, clients. Give us some. Uh, paint that picture for us. Yeah, so we're we're advising boards and C-suite executives uh, on a, a couple different areas. One, management consulting, right? So in some cases, we're coaching their staff on on how to uh, uh, better align their 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 activities and their processes with 
the strategic direction of the organization. Mm-hmm. We're um, helping uh, streamline processes and, and correct processes that aren't working well. For, for example, one of my clients right now, uh, the procurement process wasn't working well at all within IT. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've we've uh, helped them resolve that issue. We, we help clients understand how to report executively out of IT. So it makes sense to the leadership. Um, we help organizations develop strategic. Uh, we help organizations develop strategic plans for technology and how to align that with the organizational strategic plan. So we know that every individual in IT is working on activities that drive that organization where it wants to go. Okay. Not just not just where IT thinks is cool to go. Right? Yeah. And and those are. Those are often two very different things. Absolutely. Interesting. I bet that's a fascinating uh, line of work, something different every day, I'm sure. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. Let's talk about, um, you talked about a number of your experiences. um, And so there's a couple of themes that I'm just going to call out and have you react to. Um, It sounds to me like when that gentleman came and asked you to be the project manager over the the, the mainframe rewrite system, um, you're dropped into a number of fires to try to help uh, kind of quell the, f- the flame. So I would call you a fireman. W- would you connect to that or, or, or no? I think sometimes, especially when you get thrust into those kind of situations, you have to be, but I, I don't enjoy living there. Okay. I don't enjoy living in in any organization where the hair is on fire uh, all the time uh, because you get burnt out. In fact, I've learned uh, from my second mentor, I guess I would say, that that if you plan the work properly, you don't have to have to live that way. If you plan and resource correctly. So I think a lot of organizations don't even know how to do that. Sure. So they live in firefighting mode. Their people are in firefighting mode. And uh, uh, always reactive. So if you can get on the proactive side of that through, through proper uh, strategy alignment, proper planning, uh, then you, you, can, you can avoid that activity most of the time. Okay. So uh, another theme that I hear in knowing your story and having uh, some experiences with you is that uh, you're a person of high trust. And so you talked about in Tennessee, you got this job. And um, uh, the situation happened and the gentleman said, hey, I need you to take this over. So talk to us about trust in your life and some of the character things that you try to carry through every day. Yeah, so one of the wisest people that's ever lived, Solomon, said, buy the truth and don't sell it. Also, wisdom, and understanding and knowledge. Mm-hmm. And so if you're going to sit in in those um which I think most organizations refer to them as positions of special trust. There's a lot of information that comes across your desk that has to be extremely confidential, Mm -hmm. Um, especially when when you have HR type investigations uh, against employees that, um, you know, uh, you're you're dealing with multi-million dollar uh, transactions and contracts. Sure. You've got vendors that are that, you know, there's some vendors that aren't scrupulous and, and uh, you, you got to be able to maintain your integrity there. It's just extremely important to, to have that integrity and to keep that integrity, because if you ever lose it, it's gone and it's hard, hard to regain it. Yeah. Uh, so trust is very important. Truth is very important. Uh, and then we talked about earlier how you communicate. That's also very important. And Diligence is another another one, or some some might say excellence in what you do, excellence in what you deliver. Um, Solomon also said, "See a person who's diligent in his business; he'll stand before kings. He won't stand before average men." And so, it's always been a thing for me to deliver the absolute best quality product that that I can deliver personally. And when you're young, you don't even know what quality looks like. And mm-hmm. so you have to rely on on other people to show you what quality is, you know. And I say working working with the guys from from uh, 
KPMG, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, Accenture, and you see that level and quality of deliverable, mm-hmm. and you go, oh, man, I want to emulate that. Uh, right. I want my work product to be that good. Right. And, and being able to invest yourself into being able to deliver something like that builds that that trust and that diligence. And then and then you happen to be in the right place at the right time where somebody notices that and say, hey, uh, I need you to come do this for me. And and um, that's for me how I how I have grown professionally and been put in the positions that that I've been put in. And do you think again, really for our listeners, do you think that focus on <clears throat> diligence, trust, integrity, do you think that was planted in you early? Early. So tell me about that. Yeah. I remember at the beginning we talked about how I was I was raised in a very uh, conservative Christian household in church uh, three times a week, whether mm-hmm. I liked it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, and there was a, a lot of focus on on that, um, both from the school, the private school that I was in, and 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 the church environment that I was in, and just that weekly, almost daily, uh, ingraining of those qualities, and 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 um, and how that was important for us to, not only in our relationships with men, but our relationships with God. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's a daily walk you know, in every, in every sense. Um, are there any, um, mentors that you want to call out specifically, any stories that you want to tell about anybody who's kind of influenced you throughout your career up until this point, Dan? One of the skill sets that, that my primary mentor helped me develop was a ability to think forward. Mm. So what, what I've seen in, in consulting with, with a lot of the clients we have and, and um, is it's, it's not a natural skill set for people to think in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, they like to think right now. You talk about firefighting, mm-hmm. they're very reactive. So, you know, what's going to happen to me today? And I'm going to respond to that. Keep the lights on. Sure. And um, but but in order to move an organization, especially a a large IT organization forward within a within a larger corporation or government entity or whatever, you have to be able to see the next three years and you have to be able to, how am I going to take what I have now and move it there from people process technology standpoint, all of that. Mm-hmm. And to be able to think in that way um, is a learned behavior and it has to be exercised and practiced it's not it's not normal and natural for people to think that way, so he helped build that in me. Um, um, and and one of the ways that he did that was was just what are you doing next week? Do you know how many people can't even answer that question? Mm-hmm. As, as far as employees go, what do you hey, Mister Programmer? What are you doing next week? Like, they're too busy with today to tell you that, and so. He helped, he helped build those exercises in me that, that let me now look out two or three years and know, know what needs to be done and then how to move these individuals who don't think in, in the future, how to help drive them through that in order to achieve the, achieve the necessary result. So, mm. I heard a great phrase talking about that concept, Dan, one time. It said um, a lot of the senior folks that we um, – interact with like yourself help organizations see around the corner and down the hallway um and and you're right i think most organizations regardless of industry focus customer base product service whatever the case might be are so worried about what happens today tomorrow this week that um some of them are better than others obviously but the ability to see into the future is is really rare uh, it's really rare. I'm sure Tracy has some some interesting things about people who have futuristic, because um, that is a rare skill set, particularly in IT. It can be developed. Uh, I'm living proof of that, <laughs> but it but it is something you have to learn. Yeah. Are there any tips that you could give our listeners as to other than I mean, it sounds like pretty. What are you doing next week? Is the, kind of the start of that. Are there any things you follow, listen to, um, influences that help you? continue to hone that? Well, I think that's just the practice, right? I think as far as strategic thinking go, 
uh, that would be a good place to start is, is lay out your, what am I doing next week? Mm-hmm. And then if you can figure out what you're doing next week, say, well, what am I going to do next, this month? Mm-hmm. What am I going to do for this whole month? Mm-hmm. And, um, and then being able to jump up to the 50,000 foot view and, and what am I doing quarter one? What am I doing quarter two? What am I doing, you know, by quarter for the year? Right. So, you know, at that level, it may be just a set of bullets on what I'm going to accomplish in what quarter, right? Mm-hmm. And then, and then per, you know, to use a PMI term, progressive elaboration, down to the actual activities that are going to have to take place to, to do that. So yeah. how to resource it, right? Uh, with with people and dollars, uh, yeah, to get it, to get it done. That's interesting. Um, so, what are your some of your goals going forward? I mean, the view from here. You've you've had a, an amazing career. You've done a lot of really cool things with a lot of really cool projects and people across the country. What's the what's the the vision of the next 36, 48 months look like for you? So, my passion right now is just helping people that don't know how to do the things I know how to do, learn them. And so mentoring or coaching, I really, really enjoy that. I, mm-hmm. I enjoy, again, hearing an individual's issues, whether that be a board member or a, a C-suite. Hey, we've got we've got this issue. We don't know how to get technology over that hump. We want to go here. They're going there. Uh, all the way down to even the manager and supervisor level. How do we how do we coach these managers and supervisors to know how to align their day to day activity with that strategic right. plan? Sure. Uh, those skill sets just are hard to come by in IT, and they, they don't are. teach you this stuff uh, in college. And it's uh, but those things are fun for me, and that's what I enjoy doing now. I have a completely different perspective now on on investing in children than I did, you know, in my in my mid twenties. Between my um, my wife and I, we have seven, four that are out of the house now. So we have three little boys at home, uh, nine, ten, eleven, and uh, uh, mentoring them. I, I think it's just as important to to invest in them daily as it is to invest in a career. Yeah, and I think. You know, maybe this younger generation understands that better than than my generation did, because there was a lot of pressure to be at work and be at work for ten hours a day, and and, uh, and I think that's true. And that's not, a good point. Not have that work life balance that I think the the younger generation um, gets a little better than my generation did. Yeah, yeah, that's a good perspective. I think that's quite true, actually. Um, you know, I I've done a lot of work at um, state of South Carolina, as you know, and, and one of our clients for a number of years was Department of Juvenile Justice, where they have the unfortunate but important task of, of taking care of those uh, folks in that justice system. And I asked the director one time, I said, so what what makes the difference between the person, the, the young man or young woman behind the fence in your facility with other juveniles and the ones not? And, and she, you know, career person in that space. And she said, without skipping a beat, she goes, parental involvement. And it always struck with me. I was like, wow. You know, and she just, you know, she said, that's the trick. She said, if you look at 98% of these kids inside our system and inside our, our uh, facilities, parents weren't involved. And it was just, it just hit me because at that time I had young kids. And um, so, you know, those family choices are important. You know, and I think uh, I have to give an incredible amount of credit to my wife, who is also the CEO of our company, I might add, mm-hmm. uh, Barry. So not only does she do that, but she also uh, attends to those three boys like, like uh, just any, any fantastic mother mother would i'm sure and so uh you know i have an amazing wife i'll tell you that so let's talk about books what are some some books that you would recommend that you've uh gleaned some of your insights from so i'll tell you my my top three please all right number one uh a book that i've read my entire life and i probably have alluded to a couple times in this podcast is the bible Mm -hmm. um by far the greatest influence 
um, on my life um, and, and from which I glean a tremendous amount of information uh, on how to do life. Very practical uh, wisdom and understanding. Doesn't mean I'm successful at it all the time, but but it's a great roadmap yeah. uh, for us. And then uh, I just recently was reading a book called "The Real Business of IT." Um, it was a book I think published by by Harvard or uh, "The Real Business of IT." Uh, what is the real job of a CIO? Mm. And that's the ability to communicate a value. Mm. And how do you do that, whether that's through return on investment or other? How do you make sure that an organization is is very aligned with the business of the organization Mm. and being able to demonstrate and communicate that value effectively, consistently over and over again? So really, really interesting read, The Real Business of IT. And then another one that's really impacted me is uh, The Goal by Dr. Goldratt, Mm -hmm. where, you know, he, he talks about. Uh, uh, critical chain theory um, and some other, and it's written like a novel. It's a story. Uh, but the, the concepts that he teaches in that book were, were great for me. I loved it. Uh, highly recommend the goal by Dr. Goldratt. Yeah. I, uh, I've read the goal um, many years ago and I was at a conference in Charleston um, many, many years ago and he was the keynote speaker. And so we got to uh, listen to him two separate times over a two-day period. It was pretty amazing. Um, so I'm a big fan of that book, too. Yeah. So cool. Anything else you want to share with our listeners, Dan, that uh, that might be of assistance or help to them or just insights that you can provide? I would say, uh, since we are talking, I think the target audience being the younger generation mm-hmm. as we as we kind of try to give them advice for moving forward is uh, don't undervalue experience and uh, uh, or to say it positively value, value your leadership value. Mm. Barry, you and I both have some gray hair just a little bit. Yeah. And those gray hairs were earned. Yes. Um, And so, um, be sure as a young person that you find the folks around you that have earned that gray hair and have the experience uh, and and pick their brain. Be teachable. Mm-hmm. Be willing to to ask questions and have them mentor. And, and uh, I think a lot of a lot of folks come out of college thinking they're ready. And uh, I, I'm sure I felt that way, too. But. But the truth that I've found in my life is, is that experience is, is a huge part of being successful. And so learn from those folks, ask questions, be teachable, be willing to, to uh, uh, do things the way that they ask for it to be done mm-hmm. and, um, and learn to serve. Because until you've really learned to serve, you won't know what it is really to lead and um, I think that's a key, a key point I'd like to leave today. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I, uh, I kind of grew up in the restaurant industry, and I've always had this affinity. I think I've probably told you that I think there's great dignity in service, and in, there's great dignity in following a leader. You know, whether, whether or not you agree with him or her, um, there's great dignity in that. I think the Bible teaches us that. I think a lot of the great... Uh, books and tomes and thinkers, uh, if you draw underneath, will say, hey, there's great dignity in service. And and you're right. You can't be an effective leader unless, until you become an effective server. And uh, so I appreciate that very much. Yeah, you can't, you can't really know what it takes to deliver something unless you've actually delivered it. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, that goes back to your experience that you're talking yeah, about. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Dan Johnson, thank you for uh, investing some time with us and sharing so much of uh, kind of your journey and some of the lessons that you've learned. And uh, we just appreciate you being on Tech Leaders Talk today. Thank you. It was my pleasure, Barry. Thank you for your friendship. My pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today on the Tech Leaders Talk podcast. Learn more about our show at techleaderstalkpodcast.com. And follow us on social media. We are Tech Leaders Talk podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. 
And we're on Twitter at Tech Leaders Pod. Subscribe to our show wherever you get podcasts. And please share this episode with at least one person in your life who would benefit. Until next time, tech leaders, keep talking.